That said, Tim, I hope you enjoyed Tim last week, but I'll be with you today. I changed it and I messed it up. Sorry about that. We're actually going to be in Mark chapter 14, which is page 902 if you're using the hymnal. Or hymnal? Nope. Try again. The hymn rack Bible. That's what I'm going to say. So um, it has been a really good week around our house. I'm just going to share somebody else's news with you today. Um, my oldest son got saved this week. But the really exciting part about this is that he is the third young man in our church to get saved in the past three weeks. And so we've had a, one, three different boys that have gotten saved over the last three weeks. And so I am not the only proud dad around here. There's a couple others, but we'll let you tell. I'll let them tell their news, okay? But in my house, we've been talking with Josiah actually since last Easter. And um, we had a baptism last Easter, and he started asking questions. And so we worked really hard on understanding that baptism doesn't save you and things like that. Um, and this week he said, you know, he actually sat Amy and I down. He took us downstairs. He said, we need to go to the basement. I want you to sit here, Dad. I want you to sit here, Mom. He went across the room and was nervous. And he said, what I'm going to say is big. <laughs> and he said, I want to be saved by Jesus. And of course, we cried and we hugged him and we prayed. And um, I'm going to share with you some more of that experience later in the sermon. But just it, it, it made me so happy and so excited. And, you know, we've been working on this for a long time. And it's been a long time that we've been talking to him about it and answering questions and, and facing fear on his part. Because when you are convicted of your sins and you know that you haven't been forgiven, that's a scary thing. And um, so today we're talking about being prepared. And so I thought being prepared is perfect because we've been preparing Josiah. We as a family have been prepared to answer the questions. And as Christians, we need to be prepared. But Jesus was the ultimate example of being prepared. And so we're gonna to talk today about being prepared, the preparation of Jesus. Jesus was prepared who, who would say they don't like to be prepared? Right? No one says that, right? Everyone wants to be prepared. Now, not all of us do prepare, okay? I am the king of, if we've got to go somewhere, waiting until like midnight the night before, I'm being like, oh yeah, probably need to run the washing machine if I want to take those clothes. So then my wife, she can manage to get the whole family packed. And I'm like, just a second, the dryer's almost done and I'll pack my stuff. It'll be real fast. That doesn't cause fights at all. <laughs> it's a good way to go about it. It's a good plan. No, it's terrible. It's the worst. I understand that. But we all will want to be prepared. We all want to be the Boy Scout. You know, what's the Boy Scout motto? Be prepared, right? And so we all want to be prepared, but we don't all actually do it. We aren't all actually prepared. There's even a, there was a show on, and it, it's kind of created this whole subculture in our world, okay? It's called Doomsday Preppers. Is anybody familiar with Doomsday Preppers? They're not going to raise their hands because they don't want you to know that they are one, <laughs> okay? I'm prepared for that, okay? People don't want you to know that their house is stocked with enough rice to last for three months because then people like me will come knock on their door, right? But Doomsday Purpose, they do everything. There was one episode I watched. These people, they bought eggs, and then they covered them with oil of some sort because then they'll be shelf-stable, and they can sh stay on the shelf for like a year or something and not go rotten. I'll pass on that, okay? No, I don't know about that. I mean, if, if there was really a doomsday, I probably would eat the egg, right? I would. I mean, if there were no more eggs, those eggs would look really good, wouldn't they? I don't know. But, I mean, I have found some eggs that have been left in the yard after. When we used to do real eggs for Easter, did you guys do real eggs? We dyed the eggs and then we hid them in the yard. And then you run over one with a lawnmower later and you know it, right? It stinks. 
and that had some protective coating on it, and it was our, I don't know. But we laugh, but it, there are parts of the world where people that were doomsday preppers are probably surviving. Right now, things are not good in Venezuela. Things are very bad in Venezuela, and people that prepared for that doomsday are prepared, right? And we say, oh, God would never let things let, get that bad for us. I imagine there were some people in Venezuela that probably thought the same thing, right? But God does tell us that as we approach Easter, Jesus was prepared for what was coming. And we have to look at the life of Jesus and say, you know, we say that we want to follow Jesus. But then sometimes we think we're going to walk through life unscathed. Did Jesus walk through life unscathed? No. Why would I think I can walk through life unscathed and follow Jesus? No. It's not, it doesn't work like that, does it? And so, as we look at the story of the Last Supper, it's all about Jesus being prepared. Okay? We're going to look at three different examples of preparation that Jesus was prepared for everything that was going to happen that surrounds the events of the Last Supper. We're going to start in Mark chapter 14 and verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover so that you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house. The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, and found it just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. So the events that we're going to discuss today all take place on the Thursday of Passover week. This is the first day of unleavened bread. This is also the day that the Passover lamb would be sacrificed. Now, all kinds of things are going on. All kinds of events are going on. We already know Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem, he began teaching at the temple. Every day Jesus is teaching. Every day the religious leaders are coming out and they're trying to catch him off guard and they're trying to trip him up and they're trying to catch him in something. They're plotting behind the scenes how they can have him killed. Lots of things are going on. And so what are the disciples about? When supper, right? It's Passover. We get to have a feast at Passover. So it didn't matter what else is going on. We're going to have the Passover feast. I think this is kind of the equivalent in our society and in our culture today of when you're fighting with your mom and Christmas comes, right? Right? Anybody ever been fighting with their mom or you're fighting with your brother or you're fighting with your sister? I'm using all examples from my life. No, there's other examples. But you're, you're, you have a problem with somebody in your family, right? That happens sometimes in families. But Christmas comes, and so what do you do? You put all that to the side, and you buy them wonderful presents, and you give them to them, and you tell them you love them, and it's Christmas, and you have Christmas together, right? Well, for the Jewish people, it was Passover. And so for whatever else was going on, whatever drama was going on, whatever else is going on, they're going to stop and they're going to have the Passover feast. And so they say to Jesus, where are we supposed to go do this? Where are we supposed to go to have the Passover feast? We need a place. So Jesus sends two of the disciples into town to find a place. And Jesus shows us right from the beginning that he had this planned ahead of time. Because he says, you will find a man carrying a jar. That right off right there, we may not think that sounds unusual, but that would have been an unusual thing. Carrying of the water was normally reserved as woman's work. Okay? I'm not, I'm not being ugly. It's just something the women normally did. And so to find a man carrying the water would have been unusual. And they're supposed to say, the teacher needs the room, and they're going to be shown a furnished room. It reminds me of when they first came to Jerusalem and they went and they said, Jesus needs the donkey. And they said, okay, take the donkey. No problem. Right? Now they say, Jesus needs a room. Okay, we got a room. And it's all set up for you. It's all ready to go, furnished. You're all set. How many of us would like it if we were throwing some kind of party and the room was just already set? Right? Everything you need is already there. Because everything you need is never already there, is it? And so that's what, that's what happened. 
And verse 16 tells us they found everything exactly the way that Jesus described it. And then the last of that says, and they prepared the Passover. Like it's a little thing, right? It's that simple sentence. It's kind of like saying, and then the potluck was served, right? I hope the kitchen committee never feels like I say that because they, I know that there's a lot of work that goes into getting that potluck ready, right? Your card says breakfast will be served on Easter at 9 a.m. And breakfast was served. Dwayne and Mary are going to be here well before 9 a.m. Oh, and that reminds me, as I'm talking about that, Mary and Dwayne would like you to bring casseroles for Easter morning because we're going to have extra guests because we're going to invite them with the cards. So bring a breakfast casserole Easter morning with you for breakfast. But that casserole has to be prepared, doesn't it? We have to go and make the casserole. And the casserole was served? No. Somebody has to put it together, right? Somebody has to put the work in. Somebody has to do the groundwork. And that's what these disciples were doing. And they prepared the Passover. It's a lot of work. These two disciples would have had the task of preparing the Passover lamb. This is not an easy feat, preparing the Passover lamb. While I was in Uganda, I had this really nice thing that I thought I would do for Aloysius. Aloysius' birthday was coming, and he was telling me his family wasn't doing anything for his birthday, so I said, Aloysius, I think what we'll do is I'll get you a gift. And so I bought him a goat, a whole goat, okay? So I told his friend, I said, I want you to go down, I want you to buy a goat, bring it back, and you all can do whatever you do with the goat and prepare it. He says, I think it would be easier if we asked them to prepare the goat in the market. Because preparing a goat to eat is no small feat, right? Preparing a lamb for the Passover is no small feat. And so they had to prepare the Passover lamb. They didn't realize at the time that a larger Passover was in the works. And it probably seemed like a lifetime ago that John the Baptist called Jesus the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. However, at this Passover, the lamb knows what's going on. Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus was in control of the situation and none of this caught him by surprise. Peter says in 1 Peter that this was known before the foundation of the world. And Hebrews tell us us that Jesus embraced it fully. All of this should give us confidence to know that Jesus knew the path ahead of him and walked on. He knew what he was doing and he knew where he was headed. He knew what lay ahead of him, and he knew the cross that was before him. Still, he marched forward. Sometimes our life seems difficult. Sometimes our life seems hard. But God knows where we're going, and God promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he will walk with us. Are we willing to walk on with the same confidence that Jesus was even when the road seems hard. Jesus was in control of his future, and Jesus is in control of ours. But Jesus, knowing our future, doesn't mean it's all going to be rainbows and cherries. It wasn't for him. Why should it be for us? Jesus knew what was coming next, and he was prepared for that as well. And in verse 17, he says, or says, when evening came, he arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, the one who is dipping bread in the bowl with me. For the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Everything leading up to Jesus' death was not a surprise to him. Nothing was. Not even the fact that one of his dearest and closest friends would betray him. Did it make him sad? Did it break his heart? Certainly but it wasn't a surprise. 
During this dinner, a lot happens. Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. He taught them lots of different things. The gospel writers focus on different things. But for Mark, it was the focus on the betrayal that was important. The disciples know that the Jewish leaders, that other people are out to get Jesus. They know that. But this new revelation to them, that one of their number, one of the 12, one of the 12 that traveled with them, that slept next to them on the ground, that ate with them at the table, one of their friends would be the one that would betray Jesus. That was news to them. So why did Jesus tell them? Why didn't Jesus just let it happen? Jesus wanted to prepare them for what was to come. He wanted to prepare them for the fact that one of their own would turn. I don't know how many of you would say you, felt, you feel like you've been betrayed. But betrayal hurts. And you know, there's an old song and it says, only a friend can betray a friend. A stranger has nothing to gain. And that's true. A stranger is not a betrayal. It's only a betrayal when it comes from a friend. And betrayal is devastating, but when it comes from someone you trust, it's especially painful. And when it comes from within the church, it can have lasting spiritual impact. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years that want nothing to do with God because someone from within the church betrayed them. I can't tell you how many people aren't serving and aren't doing what God has called them to because of something someone within the church has done. Church should be the safest place that we go. Church should be the safest place that we go all week. However, for many people, it's not. When you come to church, you should be able to let your guard down. Be your real, true self and not have to hide from the people that you sit next to in the pews. But how many of us have been in an argument with our family or had a really bad day and when you're here, you're on the way and you have no desire to come to church and you're in a bad mood, but hello, it's so good to be at church today. We put on our church face and we put on our church hand and we give church answers and we smile. And if anyone asks, how are you doing? We say, I'm fine. When we're not fine, when we're hurting. But we're afraid that if we're vulnerable and if we're real, then the people that we share that with will take advantage of it and betray us. Church shouldn't be like that. But we're afraid of judgment from other people. And it's because we know what betrayal feels like. The disciples were about to face a major betrayal. Judas would betray Jesus, but Judas wouldn't just betray Jesus. He would betray them all. He would turn his back on all of them. And they would all feel that pain. But Jesus wanted to prepare them. He himself was prepared. And I want you to think about that for a minute. The fact that Jesus was prepared for the betrayal of Judas. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Jesus knew that Peter would deny him. Jesus had told Nathanael that while he was still under the fig tree, he knew him. That meant that from the time he was a little tiny baby, that meant that the words of Jeremiah were true that said, while you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Jesus still called Judas to be a disciple, knowing that he would betray him. Still, even though Peter was going to deny him, Jesus called him to be a disciple. Jesus loves us, even though we're going to let him down. Jesus calls us even though we're going to let Jesus down. Jesus does say that there will be consequences for Judas. He says it's better if he had never been born. 
Jesus loved Judas, and Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Judas still had the free will to choose, and he made that choice, and therefore there was punishment and judgment to come. God loves us through our sins. God loves us and calls us to him even though we sin. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Scripture tells us. That doesn't mean there's not consequences for our sin. That doesn't mean something doesn't have to happen. Jesus was prepared for the meal. Jesus was prepared for his betrayal. And Jesus was prepared for his death. He did still need to prepare his disciples for what he knew was coming, and that's just what he did. And verse 22, as they were eating, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, gave it to them, and said, take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, Truly I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is an interesting meal because it overlaps two great religious traditions. This is, first, this is the Jewish Passover meal. Second, this is the Last Supper. These are two major moments in history colliding. The Jewish Passover meal and the Last Supper. Now, I don't know if anyone here that's of Jewish descent or from a Jewish family, but if you are, then you probably know more about the Passover Seder than I do. But the Passover Seder, as the meal is called, everything has a special meaning. Every part of the meal represents something, and it's all very deliberate. It's a very scripted meal in which you say this, and then you do this, and then you say this, and then you do this. It's a very scripted and organized meal. One part of the script is that there are four toasts that are made. The first toast represents the rescue from Egypt. The second toast, the freedom from slavery. The third is for redemption by God's power. And the fourth, for a renewed relationship with God. It's after the third toast. The third is for the redemption by God's power that this takes place. It's in the part of the script where Jesus should move on, but Jesus says something different. You see, Jesus should be talking about the Passover lamb, but instead he says, this is my body and my blood. Right here, Jesus makes a turn from which there's no coming back. He has changed the night. This is no longer the Passover meal. This is now the Last Supper. It's also a first. It's the first Lord's Supper. Today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and it's going to be a very scripted time. This is accurate, you know, because if I get off and I do something wrong, people notice. And the disciples sitting there for their meal, for their Passover meal, when Jesus moved off the script, they noticed. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Our theme for Easter this year will be the Easter changed everything. And right here, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the fact that everything is going to change. We're no longer sacrificing sheep. We're no longer going back to the old covenant. All of that is about to change. This is one of the last times that they'll have together before the events start happening. Things start happening over the next few days so quickly and so fast-paced. They're not going to have time to sit down and Jesus to instruct and teach. They're not going to have time to ask questions and converse with Jesus. If you want to read more about this, in the book of John, the Last Supper is all spelled out. Much more discussion takes place. But this is their last opportunity to, take, to, to have with Jesus before things start unfolding so quickly. And what does Jesus want to do? He wants to prepare them. 
Jesus tells his disciples when they take this meal that they are to think of him. How many people have family meals and when you get together with your family, you think about your grandpa or your grandma when you're all together? Someone who's not there, right? It's because when you're with that family, you think about the person that ties you all together, right? When we go to my family dinners, I think about my grandparents because I wouldn't have my aunts and uncles if it wasn't for my grandparents, right? I wouldn't have my cousins without my grandparents. My grandparents are what ties us all together. That's what makes it the Webb family or the Hamilton family. That's what makes my family the grandparents. They are what ties us together. So Jesus says, when you take the Lord's Supper. When you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Because you know what? What ties all of us together when we take this meal, when we take this? It's Jesus, right? I love Roberta. I got no connection to her. But Jesus, right? Any of you, I could pick out and maybe somewhere we're related down the line, right? Because it's all Southern Illinois. But what ties us together, the one that we're to think of when we do this, is Jesus. At Pleasant Hill, we say we're a family of faith, hope, and love. What makes us a family? Jesus. And the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper today, we will use it to prepare ourselves, to prepare ourselves for Easter. Will we use it as a reminder to be brought together by Christ? Will we use it to prepare our hearts for betrayal from within? Will we use it to remember the sacrifice that's made on our behalf? If we were having a real meal together, would the toast remind us of freedom from oppressors, freedom from slavery, redemption by God's power, a renewed relationship with God? You see, the things of the Passover roll over into our lives today. What more could the Lord's Supper remind us of than those exact things? Freedom from our oppressors, freedom from slavery of sin, redemption by God's power, and a renewed relationship with God. As we talk about Jesus being prepared, I want to tell you something my son said to me this week. We were in the field between here and the parsonage, and we were picking those, um, those flowers, those yellow flowers. Daffodils? Daffodils? We were picking those daffodils. And we were talking about Jesus and why, why should we have the name of Jesus for people to see. And as I talked with my son on the day that he would be saved, I said, have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? And he said to me, he said, Dad, you know what? I think that if somebody knew that Jesus could forgive them of their sins and they died and they had to go to hell, they would regret every day that they ever lived. He's eight. And he understood the gospel that clearly. Because if you know that Jesus died for your sins and that the only way to have forgiveness for your sins is by asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins, if you don't do that, you will regret every day that you ever lived. It hit me like a ton of bricks out in, out in the field between here and the church. And I just want to leave it right there today. Do you know that Jesus has forgiven you of your sins? Are you prepared? Because if you're not, you will regret every day 
that you ever lived. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable here. I want you to be able to, to take down the barrier and say, you know what, I don't care what anybody thinks. When the altar is open, I'm going to the altar and I will grab whoever I've got to take with me because you know what, anybody here will go with you. And don't let fear of what people think or what people know or what people don't know or any of that separate you from the love of Christ. Because I don't want you to regret every day you've ever lived. I want you to be prepared for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you. Stand if you would. The altar is going to.